All right, so I'll start by thanking the organizers and thanks very much for making me the very last talk of the day. <laughs> so I will try to entertain you um, before dinner. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit uh, about my career, but I'm mostly gonna be talking about the, the kind of bits and pieces that I've been up to with my group over the last couple of years. Um, so I uh, loved astronomy as a kid. I read all the books, watched all the TV shows, I watched Star Trek, Voyager, and Next Generation. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know it was a real job. I, I didn't know someone could possibly pay me to look at pretty pictures of the universe. So uh, when it came to choosing what to study, I picked physics and maths because those were the things that interested me at school, and I went to Rhodes. And, but while, it was, while I was there, uh, I did a lot of things that weren't necessarily things that happened in the classroom. So for instance, taking apart some electronics with my now husband and with my best friend. Uh, we refurbished a, as part of AstroSoc, which Mo mentioned, we refurbished a 130 year old telescope with the help of SAO, um, which was really fun. And I also took part in an international astronomy competition run by ESA and the first prize was actually go to Madrid and um, you know, see what they do out there at the European Space Agency. Um, and of course, critical in this was the SKA, all the talks at SciFest, um, I worked a little bit at the SKA office. So by the end of my degree, I realized astronomy was a career. And uh, the very obvious place to study it, really the only choice in my mind was NASP. So I came to Cape Town in 2010, I did my honors. Uh, I didn't have many great photos of the time, unfortunately, um, but I very fondly remember the summer school, um, and especially just all of the, you know, getting out there and seeing what astronomy is really like. I think these, these kind of extracurricular things have a massive impact uh, as an undergraduate. I uh, decided to do my master's with Bruce Bassett, who Eli just mentioned, we, we, were, we shared a supervisor, and uh, I liked it so much, I upgraded to PhD. Um, and this was uh, at UCT, but it was actually mostly at Ames. Uh, Ames has been mentioned as the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Uh, it's um, there's me with my PhD. Uh, it's down in Musenberg. And uh, it was in that time that I first started hearing about machine learning. I was mostly working in statistics, applying statistics to astronomy, which is much more interesting than it sounds. Um, but Bruce was getting into machine learning and it was really starting, to, it was just the beginning of the, the, the early machine learning buzz uh, driven by deep learning. So by the time I uh, went to do my postdoc at University College London, it, it was very naturally on a project in machine learning. So I worked with Prof Hiranya Paris, who's still uh, an amazing mentor and collaborator to me today. And we worked on classifying supernovae for the purpose of primarily using them for cosmology. And just as an aside, uh, both my sisters live in London. So this was the first time in a long time we lived in the same city. So that was also really fun. But London is very damp and cold uh, and dark. So I, when I had the opportunity to come back to South Africa, I jumped at it. So I was offered a permanent position as a researcher at Ames, uh, again, under Bruce. And so he said, hey, do you wanna come to Cape Town and work on some machine learning and stuff? And so that's what happened. <laughs> I was very lucky. And it was also a joint position uh, with Sereo. And if you've never been to Ames, uh, it's right on the beach, so it's very, very nice. We published tons of papers at that time. I'm not gonna go through them. I wanted to just highlight one because Camille Suknunan was my very first student, uh, my first master's student. And that was a paper we published uh, applying machine learning to classify radio transients. Um, and he's just finished his PhD at uh, Imperial. So he did very well. But uh, I, while Ames was great, it's a very small group. And I was like, you know what I really want? I really want to be in a big, vibrant group with lots of people and lots of social interaction. So I was offered this position at UWC in April 2020. So I didn't get to interact with anyone except on Zoom for like two years. <laughs> um, so, but I, that's uh, where I've been uh, since 2020. It's got much better now that we're, we're back in person. So I have a senior lecturer position, but it's a 50% position. I'm also part-time staff scientist at SRE. Uh, so there's me at the university and when I was lucky enough to go visit the dishes at Meerkat. Okay, so what are the kinds of things that I've been working on? Well, the one, there's two basically big projects that I'm excited about. Well, there's many things I'm excited about. These two I'm very excited about. 
The one is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. So this is under construction in Chile. We're expecting first light early next year. Um, and it's going to run this massive 10-year legacy survey of space and time where we're going to make a movie of a huge chunk of the sky, basically. Um, and it's got incredible science goals, everything from asteroids to cosmology. Oh, and I should mention, I'm one of the South African PIs, so if this is something that excites you and you want to kind of get involved, please feel free to, to talk to me about how to get involved. See, Patricia's very happy I said that. <laughs> um, so just to give you an idea of how amazing LSC is going to be, so these are, oh, this goes a little fast. Uh, you have to watch closely. These are um, supernovae. Nope, I don't get to play it again. Okay. Well, they were uh, all the supernovae we've detected over the past 100 years, and there's just been an explosion recently, and the number is sort of 76,000. Um, so that's going to go up by an order of magnitude with LSST, and those are really well-measured supernovae. So for astrophysics, and especially for cosmology, this is an unbelievable data set. Um, and in fact, uh, the, observatory, the telescope is so sensitive that we will see something change on the sky 10 million times every single night. So it, the amount of data coming from this thing is ridiculous. Okay, so uh, I've been involved in LSSC for like a, a decade, actually. I've been part of the Dark Energy Science Collaboration, which is a collaboration of over a thousand people all over the world, mostly in the US uh, and uh, quite a large chunk in Europe. And there's a little dot in South Africa. Um, so we're basically focused on cosmology with LSST, and a lot of the work that I did um, for the, quite a few years was in observing strategy. If you're trying to do everything in a big survey, it's very important where you point the telescope and when and which filter you use, et cetera. This is a simulation of what the observing strategy will be. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details, but for a few years I led the observing strategy working group with Indesk, and we published a ton of papers on it, but I really think the biggest achievement is we actually did make it better. You know, we really came out to try to produce a great observing strategy that will work for the whole community, um, and uh, it's, it's going to have a pretty massive impact on the science outputs for LSST. I also want to mention briefly a new project that I uh, started working on with my PhD student, Tendi Mota, on trying to combine uh, the, the great spectroscopic resolution of a radio telescope with the great spatial resolution of an optical telescope specifically looking at redshift. So if that's something that you think is interesting, again, please chat to me tonight. Okay, I said there were two things I'm really excited about. The other one is, of course, the SKA. Um, I don't really need to tell this audience about how amazing it's going to be and the incredible amount of data it's going to produce. But we don't have to wait for the SKA. We can already uh, get excited and overwhelmed by Meerkat. So basically, we're facing this data explosion with all these new telescopes coming out. This is how I feel about it. Um, and so a huge amount of my research is focused on how to manage this volume of data and how to get great science out of it. The particular thing I've been interested in for the last couple of years is anomaly detection. So I think everybody knows intuitively what an anomaly is. It's something that's weird, unexpected, or rare. And there are kind of these two types. There's the known unknowns, which are things like strong lenses, for instance, that we know about, but they're hard to find. It's a needle in a haystack problem. So it's difficult to use traditional machine learning algorithms to find them because it's hard to build good training sets. But what I think really excites me is the unknown unknowns, the new discoveries, the things nobody was expecting. And the great example is the 1967 Pulsar discovery. And I like to highlight this because what it took to make this unexpected discovery was a graduate student laboriously looking over her beautiful data that, that she collected from the telescope she built. And the question is, how are we still going to make these amazing discoveries when there's 10 million alerts every night? Or there's a billion galaxies in your sample? So that's where machine learning comes in. Uh, so this is a branch uh, of machine learning called unsupervised learning, where you don't have labels, you don't really know much about your data. Um, you try to develop these algorithms that can automatically figure out kind of what normal looks like and flag things that are not normal. Uh, so I uh, worked with Bruce and built this framework called Astronomaly, uh, which can take all kinds of data, images, uh, optical radio, time series, whatever, uh, look for anomalies. And the key thing is it's got a loop that brings in a human because machine learning algorithms actually can be pretty dumb. 
or they can see something that's an anomaly, but it's actually an artifact. So you need some sort of additional human in the loop training to improve the algorithm. So some of the highlights uh, from my little group, which we affectionately called ourselves the Computational Astrophysics and Machine Intelligence Lab, or CAMEL. Renee, I'm still working on the logo. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Verlon, my PhD student, has been uh, looking through four million optical galaxies from the current biggest optical survey, Decals, and using astronomy has identified a bunch of weirdos um, that uh, we definitely need help figuring out what they are. Um, my student, Koketsu, who's just finishing up his master's, about to start his PhD with me, has, in my opinion, revolutionized the field using a new technique called self-supervised learning that can able to, it's able to just automatically say, oh, all of these galaxies are very similar and all these ones are very similar. And this is actually an extremely difficult problem um, that's uh, really made substantial strides just in the last couple of years. We've also worked in time series. Uh, so Jade is finishing up her master's with me and she's looking for anomalies in um, spectrograms, so time frequency data, looking for the next pulsar, uh, next uh, FRB or the next pulsar, that, the thing that we've never seen before. And uh, my new postdoc, Hanul Ku, is also continuing this work. And of course, if you want to detect anomalies, uh, uh, anomalies in time series, it's kind of useless if you can only do it after the fact. We need to find them so we can follow them up. So I've got a, um, a long-time collaborator from MIT, Dan Mutkrishna, and I've been working on this for years, and I've got my new postdoc, or newish postdoc, Bertie Seifert, who's carrying on with this. Okay, finally, on the science side, uh, I wanted to go back to Meerkat. So some of you may be familiar with the Meerkat Galaxy uh, Cluster Legacy Survey. Um, PI is Kenda Knowles, who's another NASP alumni. Um, and uh, it was a survey to look specifically at clusters, but it's a, it's a very big survey and it's got a huge number of, of sources in it. So I thought this is a great target for anomaly detection because Meerkat keeps churning out things that we really are very whiffly and we don't know what they are. The exciting thing is that uh, Astronomy actually did manage to make a new discovery. Uh, I don't know much about radio galaxies. I rely on my, my mentor, Larry Rudnick, and I showed him this thing and I said, what is it? And he said, I have no idea. Let's write a paper on it. So we did, and we called it, wait for it, Sauron, a steep and uneven ring of non-thermal radiation. <laughs> it turns out the trick to getting caught, getting the attention of all the YouTube science communicators is give things funny names. Uh, we don't know what it is. We think maybe a remnant of a merger of a supermassive uh, black hole binary. Some people said, no, it's a lens, I don't think so, but um, the jury's still out. We're hoping for more time to, to try and figure this thing out. But the point is, Machine learning can yield real scientific results, uh, real new discoveries. Um, this really is kind of the golden era of data exploration in astronomy. I want to end off, uh, Patricia asked me to talk a little bit about some of my work um, in, uh, specifically for women in physics, which is not science related, but enabling science. So uh, I think the gender gap in, uh, it, well, in STEM fields in general is quite well known. It was actually mentioned a few times today that the, you know, NASP has sat at a pretty consistent 30% women. Um, and it's something that actually just gets worse with, with, as you go up in career levels. So we're basically losing all the, it's called the leaky pipeline. You lose all the women as you go. Um, so back in 2015, Bruce, uh, he, he had the seed of an idea. He, there were these students from Mauritius. We couldn't really convince the, the women students to come over to South Africa and continue with their studies, uh, you know, uh, they were specifically very reluctant. And he thought maybe mentoring by senior women scientists might help. So we had a, a little virtual mentoring program that I ran. And it was just a few of us, there were like five students. And in 2017, I realized that this has amazing potential. So I shut that down and I started the Supernova Foundation, which is an international mentoring program for women and gender minorities in physics. So these are just some examples of our fantastic mentors. Um, we literally span the globe. On Slack, if I type at channel, it warns me I'm about to notify people in 19 different time zones. Um, so this is a map of our mentors, where darker means more mentors, and the mentees distribution is pretty different. We have a huge contingent from India, very little penetration into Africa. So please talk to me if you have thoughts on this. Um, so basically, what, what's the idea? Well, we have about 200 mentees and about 100 or so mentors from 51 countries. So the mentors and mentees meet regularly for private mentoring. 
Uh, and this is, you know, just advice and support and just helping deal with all the kind of normal pressures that happen in your studies uh, for students from undergraduate to postgraduate level. Um, we're open to uh, anyone who identifies as a woman or, you know, non-binary, transgender, etc. Um, and we also run these webinars on <laughs> sort of normal things like CVs and work-life balance, but also, you know, serious uh, topics related to women, um, like harassment, etc. Uh, so this has really gone from strength to strength over the last few years. We now have a constitution and a leadership committee, so uh, it's really uh, going extremely well. Please chat to me if you want to get involved, and we're always looking for more mentors and mentees, um, and the website's at the bottom. I want to conclude uh, thinking about the impact of NASP. I think this is something that every speaker has brought up, uh, how critical a role NASP has played. Um, I really... I really think it's quite unique and it's quite a genius solution to the problem of how do you grow capacity because if you're one astronomer on your own in at a university and you're trying to build a group it's extremely difficult um, so just being able to pool those resources I think was was really a great solution and it, you know the results are in the room um, and yeah so I just want to acknowledge the fact that it's taken absolute unwavering dedication and hard work by many of the key players who are here and many others who aren't here um, so just I want to add my thanks to everyone else and say thank you so much and I'll stop there